Good morning. Welcome to our morning moment with Jesus on this Wednesday, October the 14th. So good to be with you today. I hope that your day uh, has gotten off to a good start. Mine has, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the activities of the day. This evening at the Central Church of Christ here in Hereford, we'll be gathering uh, for a devotional time at seven o'clock. And uh, we just look forward to that in the middle of the week every every week. Let's begin with prayer, and then we're going to get right back into looking at John chapter 14 as we continue to look at Jesus' farewell discourse. Let's bow. Father, we're so grateful for your blessings and your being with us. We thank you for all that you do. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the time that he spent on this earth, that he came in fulfillment of your will, your plan, and he died for our redemption, for our for our sins. Father, as we look at these final words to uh, that Jesus shared with his uh, apostles, help us to be encouraged by them and be uplifted and strengthened as we uh, face our own lives and our own difficulties. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we're looking, as we said, <clears throat> at the farewell discourse of Jesus to the apostles. It's the final night of the earthly life of Christ. Now, as, as we reckon time, it is sometime during the night, Thursday. However, looking at the Jewish reckoning, since it's already after sundown on Thursday, they reckon it as Friday. And so we're calling it Friday, even though it is Thursday night, early Friday morning, when all these things that we're talking about with this discourse and the prayer and the arrest and all that we'll see in the coming days, uh, that all takes place. It's just a matter of hours until Jesus will be arrested. He will face a series of so-called trials and then be crucified on Friday. As the minutes are ticking away, he is taking a final opportunity to encourage comfort, and strengthen the 11 who are with him. Now keep in mind, as we examine these verses over the next several days, that Jesus was first and foremost addressing his apostles. And we can make general application of many of the verses, but we must take care not to claim promises given exclusively to those men. We're going to pick up in Jesus' discourse right where we stopped yesterday in John chapter 14, verse 15. Let's read verses 15 through 21. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever, that is, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You will live also. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and will disclose myself to him. A Christian, in essence, is one who loves Jesus. We have used our religious exercises, such as offerings, church attendance, and so on. We've used those as a barometer of love for Christ. While religious devotion may fulfill the greatest commandment. It hardly touches the second greatest, 
to love our neighbor as ourselves. You remember not too long ago, a few days back, we talked about Jesus' parable in Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, a parable that he taught. Uh, in that, he taught that this second greatest commandment will have a primary emphasis on the day of judgment. I mean, after all, the best barometer of our love for God is our love for his children. Those who love Christ, or those rather, I should say, whose love for Christ is validated by their obedience are granted a most precious gift, the Holy Spirit. Here in the New American Standard Version, in verse 16, he is called helper. Other translations use the word counselor. The Greek word that John wrote here literally means one called alongside to assist or succor. The indwelling of the Spirit is reserved for Christians. John 7 verses 39 and 40. Let me just briefly mention uh, some of the things that the Spirit does with us and for us. Romans 8, verses 9 through 11, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, he actually enters our bodies. He marks us as God's possession. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 22, Ephesians 1, verse 13, and chapter 4, verse 30. Through him we are sanctified. Romans 15, verse 16. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. Through him we are taught. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 through 16. Ephesians 1, verses 17 and 18. 1 John 2, verse 27. Through him we are guided. Romans 8, verse 14. Galatians 5, verses 18. And through him we are strengthened. John 14, 26, we'll read in a little bit later this morning. Through him, we receive adoption. Romans 8, verses 12 to 17. We receive gifts with which we serve the church. Romans 12, verses 6, 7, and 8. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 11. Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 13. And through him, we uh, have bear fruit for the glory of God. Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. He also intercedes for us when we do not know how to pray, Romans 8, 26. And he refreshes us when we are downcast, Acts 3, verse 19. John 7, verses 38 and 39. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Now, even this very brief job description of the Holy Spirit makes, makes one want to shout with thankful praise for the blessing of the Spirit indwelling the child of God. The apostles are going to lose Jesus in just a little while. This will be a devastating blow. They're, they will lose their teacher, their guide, their empowerment. However, all they lose when Jesus leaves will be replaced when the Spirit comes. In fact, the book of Acts, the continuing story of Jesus, Acts 1 verse 1, is not so much the Acts of the Apostles as it is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. He is another helper of the same nature and ability as Jesus. Well, let's read some more now. <clears throat> Verses 20, 22 through uh, <clears throat> 27. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? 
Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. <clears throat> Another question arises at this point from the group. This time it's a relatively obscured disciple, one that John calls Judas, and then quickly says, not Iscariot. So we'll, we call him the other Judas sometimes. He's also known in Matthew 10, verse 3, and Mark 3, verse 18, by the name of Thaddeus. Still thinking about a political kingdom, Thaddeus cannot understand why Jesus would not manifest himself to the entire country. A king, after all, would want a wildly publicized coronation. Jesus scarcely acknowledges that Judas even spoke. Instead of answering his question, Jesus reiterates the points that Judas obviously missed. Love is shown by obedience. Those who love Jesus have a home with God. However, the home Jesus describes to Thomas in the beginning of this chapter was a future heavenly one. The home he speaks of here is a present earthly one, the home Jesus described uh, as the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He also said, reiterates that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are essentially one in character, quality, and purpose. And he also says that the Holy Spirit will continue his ministry after he leaves. Part of the Holy Spirit's continued ministry is to establish apostolic doctrine. Acts 2 verse 42 says that the early church continued in the apostles' doctrine or the apostles' teaching. In order to accomplish that, the apostles will need divine recall of the words and acts of Jesus. Even more, the Holy Spirit will in interpret and apply those words and actions for the apostles, especially when they stand to preach. Eventually, the apostolic doctrine was written down the, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in order that successive generations of Christians might have it and be able to read it, people like you and me. <clears throat> Although the process was a bit more complex than we have time to describe here, we basically believe that the 27 books of the New Testament comprise that apostolic doctrine, that apostolic teaching. It is the core message of the faith. While it is not all Jesus said or did, or even all that the apostles taught about him, it is all that is needed for the church to exist, to grow, and to endure until Christ returns for his bride. I want to turn now at this point to 2 Peter chapter 1 and read just a few verses there that I believe make an a, uh, important comment on what I've just said. 2 Peter 1 verses 2, 3, and 4. Peter writes, 
grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these, he has granted to us his precious and, and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now we read just a moment ago, verse 27, back in John 14. And with that verse, Jesus kind of comes full circle and has put, puts a, a book in, another book in on to what he's just been saying here in John 14. He says in 14, 27, do not let your heart be troubled. That's the way the chapter began. The next couple of days will be traumatic for the apostles. They will run from Jesus in his crucible hour and then watch from a distance as he is beaten and crucified. Then their joy uh, at the resurrection, uh, there will have, they will have joy at the resurrection, uh, will turn to dismay again at the ascension of Jesus back to heaven. Their road ahead leads to rejection, mocking, beatings, and for all but John, martyrdom. Yet, Jesus offers them peace. Not peace without tribulation, but peace in the midst of tribulation. That offer continues to extend to each of his followers. Because we have the Holy Spirit in us, because we have the hope of a home with God, and because we are confident in the return of Christ, these brief and momentary afflictions are palatable for what they promise to bring. See Romans 8, verse 18, 22, and 23. Well, let's finish reading <clears throat> the verses here in John 14 uh, as we uh, continue this morning. John 14, beginning in verse 28. You heard that I said to you, I go away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Now I have told you before it happens, so that when it happens, you may believe. I will not speak much more with you, for the ruler of the world is coming, and he has nothing in me but so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up. Let us go from here. Jesus has already twice described his imminent departure and return. Verses 2, 3, 18, 19, and now in 28 and following that we just read. The disciples should be happy for Jesus' homecoming, but they are too overwhelmed with their own loss to rejoice in Jesus' gain. Even so, Jesus does not tell them all this so they can rejoice with him, but so they can be assured that Jesus knows what he is talking about. Satan's attack is only hours away. He will conquer Judas Iscariot, defeat Peter and the other apostles, and have his way with the body of Jesus through the, the beatings and the scourging and, and the crucifixion. Even though it looks pretty bad, the truth is Satan has no power over Jesus. He was unable to tempt him in the wilderness 
and he will be unable to defeat him on the cross or to hold him in the tomb. Satan does not have the power to influence Jesus, not because of Satan's power, but because of God's will. Having said all of this, Jesus says it's now time to leave. Well, we still have two more chapters of this upper room discourse left. However, the remaining two chapters only take about 10 minutes to read. And even though it may be a summary of what Jesus said on that occasion, we're probably not looking at an extended discourse. Jesus apparently continues to talk as they <clears throat> linger for a few minutes in the upper room, perhaps to clean up after supper, to collect their things and put on their tunics and before they go out into the night air. Jesus will continue talking as they walk through the streets of Jerusalem to the Kidron Valley, John 18, verse 1. That gives him ample time to get all this in before his private prayer in the garden. Tomorrow, we're going to be continuing to look at these final words of Jesus to the 11. Beginning in chapter 15, he will speak of the unity of his followers with himself as he speaks the allegory of the vine and the branches. He will also speak about the unity of his followers with one another and the resultant opposition from the world. Before we go now, let's pause and close with a prayer. <clears throat> Father, again, we're grateful for your blessings and for your word. We're grateful for the encouragement that Jesus gave to the uh, apostles on that night. And we pray, Father, it will be encouragement to us. Help us, Father, to take this encouragement, this faith that, that it produces in us, that helps to grow within us, and to stand strong for you, even in the face of opposition, even in the face, if it should mean one day martyrdom, that we will be faithful to your word and to Jesus, your Son and our Savior. Father, I continue to pray for uh, those dealing with COVID, whether it be actual illness themselves, whether it be battling it as a health care giver, whatever way, and just pray, Father, that, that uh, we can get through this situation as healthy as possible. I continue to pray for the election in this country that's just about three weeks away. And we pray, Father, that, that your will be done. Be with us, Father, the remainder of this day and throughout our lives. We ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I hope your Wednesday is good, this midweek day of, the, of uh, this work week. And uh, Lord willing, I'll be back tomorrow, and you will as well. And we'll share again in a few moments with Jesus in the morning. We'll see you then.